got to tell my grandchildren to take opportunities to learn formally or informally, not necessarily through school, because the, the world is a, its own educational laboratory, and one does not need formal education to learn, enjoy, and have a ball in life. Mm -hmm. I believe we have one shot at consciousness, and we can choose to employ it almost as we wish, given the realities of the lives that we have, the resources, and we can choose to live life energetically and curiously with critical thinking and appreciation of art and the world around us, or we can choose to not be very happy and the choices are regardless of whether regardless of whether you're qualified to do it imagine a task in which you could be in the flow that is lost in your work for long periods of time describe this ideal task i want to work on solving problems that have yet to be solved i could easily get lost in working on any task that required me to do research to do quantitative analysis or simply cleverly brainstorm new solutions to approaching a problem that no one has figured out yet. So what do you value above your own life? And how can you use your talents to serve the greater good? Above all else, I really value my ability to leave a tangible impact on the world around me. Whatever I work on in life, I want it to improve the lives of a significant number of people in some impactful, tangible way. This could mean working on a software project that makes people's lives easier and more convenient. This could, be, this could mean working as part of a laboratory in order to find a cure for a disease that has yet to be cured. Or this could even be something as simple and conventional as working on a political campaign whose goals I align with. Thank you. Great. Really so amazed that uh, we're going to have this reunion and it started with your idea. And tell me how it came about. It's a, it's a longer story than you probably want to know all of. Um, I had been injured, and I was in about six months of physical therapy full time. Okay. I was unable to work, I was unable to get out of the house, I was unable to drive had a lot of time to think about stuff while I was doing physical therapy. And one of the things I thought about was Sycamore School. And I kept thinking, boy, it would be great to do what my teachers there did. How fun would that be? Maybe I have a new career path. Huh. I wonder what Paul Douglas would say about that. And I looked him up online and he popped up immediately. And I sent off an email to him and got an immediate response. And Paul was always kind of, uh, he was my first male teacher. I think that one of the things that Terry was able to do was he was able to see you right away as to who you were. Even today, when we were sitting in the circle, he noticed that I was sitting on the outside of the circle. <laughs> There are a lot of people around, but he right away said, Evie Klein, you get in the circle. <laughs> Which was, you know, definitely in the fifth grade year was sort of what I think I, he helped me realize that it wasn't just okay to be the good kind of quiet kid who did, did okay at school, but really to show being yourself, which Sycamore fostered the whole way through, but that Terry then helped um, people blossom to be their best. And um, even, I think that then in Claremont, you know, El Roble and the high school sort of were much more about you succeeded by assimilating. Um, what you gained at Sycamore was still in there. And so then after high school, I think all of us, and, or I can speak specifically about myself, tapped back to that Sycamore self and were then able to kind of lead our lives in an in interesting path. Terry left before sixth grade for me so I didn't get to finish with him but I did get to be in fifth grade and it was really one of the best years of school of any school I've ever been to I mean I still remember it it's it's Terry's you know he is the teacher but really he's a facilitator he knows 
he he knew our personalities so well that he could just kind of like he played us like an orchestra. He was like a conductor of the class. It was really really rare and graceful the way he operated. You know, to me, a teacher is like a divine physician, bringing the antidotes and the augmentations of remedies to every kid. And would you use the same remedy for every illness? No way. You know, kids don't have illnesses, but they have different capacities and securities or insecurities or interests or fears. And really the job is, in my mind, is to inspire kids to be the greatest they can be. I mean, if you really want to learn, you want somebody to craft the experience to your interest. And then at some point the interest becomes all yours and then you learn through some kind of mentorship or you seek your own resource to learn. Um, I think that's what I was always trying to achieve. Let's, let's move you to a spot where you could learn for yourself and independently. I'm hoping teachers can do that today. I, I think there's, there's ugly stuff happening in education right now, you know, where No Child Left Behind has created this, you know, era of consequence, you know, that schools will be called failures or classrooms will be called inadequate based on some arbitrary moment in time when assessment's done. It doesn't work. Really what we ought to be looking at is where's a kid today? Where do they get to? What is, what's the growth that takes place as a result of the teacher's impact on their lives? That's how we ought to be measuring.